It was 1915, the beginning of a new year, the beginning of new hopes. The old hopes, the glorious ones of 1914, were buried in the mud and clay of trench warfare. The Schlieffen Plan, Plan 17, the Russian steamroller, in the hangover of this cold dawn of 1915, they were only memories of the time when all Europe had been drunk on the wine of quick victory. It was stalemate, puzzling to generals reared on the concept of the sweeping manoeuvre, frustrating to soldiers trained for wars of movement, disillusioning to new arrivals. We'd been brought up on histories of the Boer War and patriotism and heroics and everything, and we thought the war was going to be over before we could get there. However, in about half a minute, all that had gone. I just wondered what the devil had got into, <laughs> because um, it was nothing but mud and filth, and all the chaps who were already there were... Well, they looked like tramps. They were all plastered in filth and dirt, unshaven. During the long winter, General Joffre, the French commander-in-chief, pondered the new problems of trench warfare. The enemy had been driven back, but he had firmly fastened himself upon our soil, and we had been obliged to leave in his hands for a length of time whose duration no one could now estimate, a rich part of our country. It was not enough that we had prevented the enemy from winning the war. It was essential to achieve a complete victory over him. Reconquer Belgium, the north of France, and our precious provinces of Alsace and Lorraine. This was the heartbreaking problem which faced me. To hold their conquests, the Germans were building a fortress. They threw up earthworks, they dug defensive interlocking trench systems, they strengthened their lines with barbed wire and machine guns. Wire and guns saved men, men to form a new striking force. Falkenhayn, chief of the German general staff, had wanted to use it to smash the British into the sea while they were still weak in numbers. But Germany had two fronts, west and east. And in the east, the Russian masses were pressing Germany's Austrian allies back and back into the Carpathian passes. Beyond were the rich plains of Hungary's homeland. Falkenhayn had to give up his plan to attack the British. The need for some relief to the Austrians by means of an attack in another spot became imperative. With a heavy heart, I had to make up my mind to employ my only available reserves in the east. For this relief attack, Falkenhayn chose the Masurian Lakes region of East Prussia where the Russians still occupied a wide tract of pine forests and lakes, carved out by the glaciers in the ice ages of long ago. Now it was winter, January 1915. Through blizzards and temperatures below zero, men and beasts of two German armies moved up to their assault positions opposite the Russian 10th Army. The German plan was bold and simple. Outflank the Russians from the north, curl round them, and herd them into the forest of Augustov and destroy them. By the beginning of February, just as the Germans were ready, fresh blizzards screamed through the endless forests, piling snowdrifts across the roads and tracks. Movement became almost impossible. But Hindenburg, the doer and massive commander in chief, gave the order to attack. On February the 8th, the two German armies struck. Behind fire from batteries of howitzers, they stormed forward, driving the Russians before them. Once more, a great Russian army was retreating like a clumsy, helpless and bewildered beast under the blows of a drover. For 10 days, 350,000 men floundered through the snow to escape the German pincers, but always they were remorselessly shepherded south and surrounded. 
By the 21st of February, the German victory was complete and terrible. The corpses of a hundred thousand peasant soldiers of the Tsar lay frozen and forgotten. The horror of the campaign chilled even Hindenburg himself. The name of the winter battle in Masuria charms like an icy wind or the silence of death. Men will ask themselves, have earthly beings really done these things? Or is it all but a fable or a phantom? Are not these marches in the winter nights, that camp in the icy snowstorm, that last phase of the battle in the forest of Augustov, but the creation of an inspired human fancy? The people of Petrograd were told the stark facts of the disaster. A hundred thousand dead, a hundred and ten thousand prisoners, and three hundred guns lost. But the reason for the defeat was concealed from them. The Russian army was starved of weapons and ammunition. In December 1914, the Russian chief of staff at the front had written to the Minister of War. The men are saying, why should we perish of hunger and cold? without boots. The artillery is silent, and we are killed like partridges. Russian prisoners liberated by the Cossacks abused their rescuers. Who asked you to rescue us, fools? We don't want to hunger and freeze again. The Russian guns needed 45,000 shells a day. In February 1915, Russian factories were supplying them with only 20,000. This was not a war for soldiers alone. It was a war for industry, too. And only Germany, the most modern industrial power in Europe, was equipped for it. Yet, short of heavy guns, short of ammunition, short even of rifles, the Russian army in Galicia continued with indomitable peasant courage to force the Austrians back. Before them stood the Austrian fortress of Przemysl, the last rock against the Russian tide that threatened to engulf Hungary. Behind the shattered forts of the perimeter, the Austrian garrison had been cut off for three months and food was now so short that the population were eating cats and dogs as well as horse meat. The Austrian commander decided on a last desperate attempt to break out. It failed, and on March the 22nd, the great fortress surrendered. A 107,000 men and 20,000 sick and wounded fell into Russian hands at Przemysl. Croats and Ruthenians and Hungarians and Germans, the unwilling and the willing soldiers of the Emperor Franz Josef. The feeble state of the Austrian army haunted Falkenhayn. The appeals of the Austrians for assistance never ceased. Symptoms of disintegration became more and more evident in formations of Czech and Southern Slav recruits. Once more, Germany had to help Austria against the Russians. But how? Hindenburg and Ludendorff still passionately believed that the war could be won in the East. They repeatedly told the Kaiser that if only enough forces were given them, they could destroy the whole Russian army by huge pincer movements. But in the end, the Kaiser rejected their grandiose ideas and accepted Falkenhayn's less ambitious plan. Falkenhayn proposed a breakthrough between the towns of Gorlitsa and Tarnow, followed by a lightning pursuit across the communications of the Russian armies that threatened Hungary. 
It wouldn't win the war, but it would be a smashing blow that would paralyze the Russian army. April brought Europe her first wartime spring. The grim Russian winter melted into a landscape of astonishing beauty. Troops of Falkenhayn's striking force settled down for the long train journey to the wide horizons of the east. This was an army made for victory. Only the Marne and First Ypres marred a record of success, stretching back through Sedan in 1870 to Waterloo. At fixed intervals, the packed trains rolled eastwards, speed 19 miles an hour. 180 trains to each army corps. With the army went the now familiar German battering ram, medium and heavy howitzers, huge stocks of shells to sweep away the Russian defenses like a cyclone. The breakthrough was to be made by the 11th Army under von Mackensen. His orders were clear. The 11th Army must make quick forward progress. This is of fundamental importance. Only in speed lies the guarantee that we shall be able to stop the enemy bringing up his reserves. By the 28th of April, 170,000 men and 1,000 guns had been slotted into an 18-mile front. No shortage of ammunition here. Falkenhayn wrote, By the spring of 1915, GHQ was relieved of any serious anxiety with regard to munitions supply. May the 2nd, from 6 till 10 in the morning, a thousand guns, half of them heavy, smashed the Russian defenses to shreds. attack went in. Neither fire, nor trenches, nor barbed wire could stop the assault, although our ranks became thinner and thinner. After 35 minutes, and despite the tropical heat, we reached the enemy. The Russians clung ferociously to their trenches, but in another 10 minutes, the job was finished. Von Mackensen signaled to the Kaiser, I report to your majesty that the order to make the enemy's positions in the Carpathians untenable has been carried out. The enemy is in retreat along the whole line. Against the weight and power of the German pursuit, the Russians could do nothing. A Russian commander wrote, The retreat from Galicia was one vast tragedy for the Russian army. No cartridges, no shells. Bloody fighting and difficult marches, day after day. No end of weariness, physical and moral. Faint hopes followed by sinister dread. For 11 days, the German heavy artillery swept away whole lines of our trenches and their defenders with them. We hardly replied. There was nothing to reply with. The Russian general had sent an urgent message to Petrograd. There are no rifles. 150,000 men are without rifles. From hour to hour it is worse. We await the heavenly manner from you. At the end of May, Mackinson's troops marched in triumph into the fortress city of Pshemizl. It had been in Russian hands for only two months, 
The victorious Germans and Austrians had marched more than a hundred miles through the heat and dust of the Galician summer. They had forced the Russians to retreat along the whole Carpathian front. As they entered Przemysl, their triumphant progress was being celebrated 450 miles behind them in Berlin, with flags and bell ringing and the cheers of a proud and grateful nation. The fall of Peshemizel marked yet another stage in the dumb but terrible agony of the Russian peasant armies. The Russian soldier was a very good soldier, provided he was properly led. But without officers, see officers were wounded or killed, this simple Russian mushik had not much initiative. After all, they were mostly uh, peasants, very simple good-natured men, very big and tough, but without guidance they were lost. And very often, they, um, to our great surprise, they surrendered in droves. By the time they were captured, some Russian soldiers had been retreating for a month. Over a hundred thousand of their comrades had been killed. The Russian army was at the end of its power. The uninterrupted fighting in the Carpathians had costed heavy losses. The deficit in officers and men was terrifying. The lack of arms and ammunition was catastrophic. For the Russian prisoners, the unequal struggle against Germany's might was over, and they celebrated the miracle of still being alive. On the Western Front, spring brought new hope. It was the time for battle again, and the Germans knew it. Their 400 miles of trenches behind barbed wire, sometimes as thick as a thumb, walled the French off from their lost lands. As the weather improved, the French would be coming to take them back. The Germans watched and waited for the attacks they knew must come. Opposite them, sometimes half a mile away, sometimes only 20 yards, the Allies also waited. Temporary lines where the balance of war had settled at the end of 1914 were acquiring a squalid permanence. Haphazard sections of trench were deepened and joined to each other. Drains were scooped in the mud. Holes in the ground had been converted into dugouts. They were at least splinter proof, which meant much to an army fighting an artillery war. soldiers knew something must happen soon. A French dragoon wrote, In spring, the benumbed army stirred itself, stretched its legs, and awoke to the fact that a new era was about to begin. The change took place with the greatest mystery. Rumors, coming no one knew where from, began to circulate. The basic question of 1915 was, could the Allies break through the German defensive works? Lord Kitchener expressed the widespread doubts. I suppose we must recognize that the French army cannot make a sufficient break through the German lines of defense to cause a complete change of the situation. The German lines in France may be looked upon as a fortress that cannot be carried by assault. But the Germans left General Joffre, the French commander-in-chief, with no choice 
The best and largest portion of the German army was on our soil, with its line of battle jutting out a mere five days' march from the heart of France. This situation made it clear to every Frenchman that our task consisted in defeating this enemy and driving him out of our country. But how? French observers peered at the German front line. Week by week, month by month, battle by battle, the Germans had strengthened and deepened their defensive position. From behind the trenches, the gun flashes told the Allies of the power and numbers of the artillery supporting the German soldiers. The answer, the French concluded, lay in artillery and high explosive shell. Given enough, the infantry would merely occupy German defences already ploughed up and made harmless. In the words of Sir Douglas Haig, commanding the British First Army, When there were sufficient shells, we could walk through the German lines in several places. But were there sufficient shells, sufficient gunpowder? When war broke out, France had only 300 heavy guns to oppose 3,500 German medium and heavy guns. Since then, only 48 new heavies had been delivered, and 18 of those had blown up in the gunners' faces. Now, in a desperate attempt to catch up, they were pressing into service the old, slow-firing big guns stripped from fortresses like Verdun and Toul. The BEF by the first half of 1915 had only 10 heavy guns per division against the German 20. Incidentally, every time our artillery opened up on them at that particular time, they would come back tenfold. If our artillery fired about five or six rounds, they'd fire 50 to 60 back at us. But all was it was that unequal bashing that, that got the infantrymen. But we couldn't, if we'd got a gun at all, we had a machine gun, it's true, but uh, that was only a puny effort. It was these colossal shells that drained on and on, and we could do nothing about it. The earthworks and the barbed wire, such as they were, had been blown to pieces long since. And the result was that practically the whole of the front line around the town of Ypres was a series of holes in which men crouched and waited for the end. In February, Sir John French rationed his heavies to eight rounds a day and his field guns to ten for ordinary purposes. A British gunner wrote to Lloyd George, We don't know or care who is to blame. We only know that we are being starved to death for want of shells and our infantry are being fated daily to a more and more terrible task. Trench mortars and mine throwers were lacking too. The soldiers of the country that thought itself the workshop of the world were reduced to homemade equipment. They invented the hairbrush grenade, a slab of gun cotton fastened to a piece of wood and lit with a match or cigarette. There was also a jam tin filled with shredded gun cotton and nails. Some units improvised trench mortars. A corporal said to me, Come along here, we're going to let our mortar come and have a look at it. It was a homemade mortar. It looked to me like a piece of rainwater pipe. And it was bound all round with what appeared to be a leather throng to take the resistance. There was a plate bolted on the back and a touch hole with a piece of fuse in it. The charge was a screw of gunpowder in a paper screw. And the bomb was a jam tin filled with explosive. They lit the fuse and all stood well away. Well, the bomb just went off, whizzed over, tumbled over two or three times, dropped somewhere near the German trench and went off with a big bang. <laughs> 
The French had to improvise too. In some parts of the country, the manufacture of munitions became a cottage industry. As the day of the Allied offensives approached, the shell shortage remained desperate at the British base depot. It was the base ammunition depot for the Southern armies, and it was, I suppose, an ex-builder's yard. It consisted of about a couple of sheds, room to put a couple of railway trucks or wagons in, and the total stock couldn't have exceeded about 2,000 rounds of ammunition of all kinds. We used to issue it in half dozens, dozens, and sometimes single rounds to some of the bigger batteries. And I suppose one day's loading would be a couple of railway trucks. And of course, it was perfectly absurd. The ammunition we had was treated as if it were gold ingots. It was laid out in very neat rows. It had to be counted every day and lined every day and dusted every day. Early in 1915, the Allies began a series of attacks to wear down and soften the German defenses. Suddenly, a thunderclap right beside us. An enormous fountain of black smoke seems to spring out of the ground, hurling hundreds of clods up to the sky, and they rain down like hailstones on our heads. It's a heavy melanite shell just a few feet away. We run in all directions. Then, one by one, we recover. The French spring offensives cost them 240,000 men, killed or wounded. On March the 10th, the British attacked at Neuve-Chapelle. There were enough hoarded shells to smash the German front line trench, but the German second line was not destroyed. The attack could go no further. On April the 6th, the French attacked at saint Miel to pinch out the German salient. They failed, but these were only preliminary attacks. The real attempt to break through the German defences was planned for May. But it was the Germans who attacked on April the 22nd. Their purpose was to cover up their troop movements away from the Western Front to Gorlitzer Tarnow. Against the French sector at Ypres, they let loose a hideous new weapon, which science had added to the German soldiers' armoury poison gas. And about four o'clock in the afternoon, there was a very heavy bombardment started. And a little later on, we saw the effects of this. The first thing was hundreds of French troops running away. And they were just like ants. They weren't sticking to roads or paths or anything else. They were all over the fields and breaking through hedges and everything. No arms, they'd all gone. They're clutching their throats and saying, gaz, gaz, and so on. We tried to rally them as they got level with us and they wouldn't uh, stay. And uh, all we got from them was alley man, bomb, bomb, malad, malad. And they kept going and uh, we could all just turn around and shoot them, which we did, run away from us. And momentarily, we looked and here we saw this green cloud coming along the ground. The gas attack made a gap in the Allied lines four and a half miles across. The Canadians were thrown into the breach and for three weeks they held on alongside British and French troops and braved the new horror. One chap had his hand blown off and his wrist was fumbling around, tearing at his throat. Uh, the effect of this gas was to form a sort of foamy liquid in one's lungs and more or less in time drown one if you're unlucky because a lot of the men died pretty quickly others were soon down dying they were in fact drowning from this uh, beastly foam coming up from their lungs there must have been two or three hundred men and they were wriggling and wreathing in all positions, tearing at their throats, their faces black. And an RAMC sergeant, he stood by there and 
he was, he looked, well, I've never seen a man look so despondent. He says, look at the poor bastards. He said, we can't do anything for them. A young German officer wrote, the effects of the successful gas attack were horrible. I do not like the idea of poisoning men. Of course, the entire world will rage about it at first and then imitate us. This was the day when the last vestige of glamour and glory went out of war. Behind its ancient moat and ramparts, Ypres itself became a symbol of resistance and unstinted sacrifice. The great German shells set the town ablaze. Centuries of history crumbled at each blast. But on a sudden, fierce destruction came, tigerishly pouncing. Thunderbolt and flame showered on her streets to shatter them and toss her ancient towers to ashes. The shelling had started again in Ypres, and by the time we got up, marching up to the town, it looked as though the whole place was on fire. Buildings right and left of us were blazing away, and the heat was so intense in some of the narrow streets that as we were marching up in column of four, the men on the flanks had to creep into the middle to avoid the blistering heat. And one could see the haggard desolation on their faces as they also surveyed the havoc around them. The German attacks at Ypres rammed home the terrible lesson. This was a new kind of war, a war of engineering and chemistry and industrial power. The German successes at Ypres and in Russia had been gained in the Ruhr. Lloyd George, the British Chancellor of the Exchequer, saw what the Allies were up against. The Germans and Austrians between them had, even at the commencement of the war, much larger supplies of war material and more extensive factories for the turning out of supplies than the Allied countries possessed. And they have undoubtedly since made much better use of their manufacturing resources for the purpose of increasing that output. Germany is the best organized country in the world and her organization has told. In Britain, guns and shells were still being produced by a system designed for small armies and small wars. The main supplier was Woolwich Arsenal. Woolwich was an arsenal, not a factory like Krupp's, geared for mass production. By the spring of 1915, the War Office had placed munitions orders with over 2,500 firms in Britain. But there is a long gap between demand and delivery. Less than a quarter of what had been contracted for was actually delivered in time, and no attempt had yet been made to mobilize the whole of British industry. For Lloyd George, a crusader by nature, here was a cause. Soldiers were dying in France, and muddle and inefficiency at home were letting them down. On February the 22nd, he wrote to Asquith, the Prime Minister. I sincerely believe that we could double our effective energies if we organized our factories properly. All the engineering works of the country ought to be turned on to the production of war material. While this process is going on, the population ought to be prepared to suffer all sorts of deprivations and even hardships. On May the 9th, the French and British armies launched a new offensive. The British artillery had enough shells for only three quarters of an hour's bombardment, and nine out of ten shells were shrapnel, useless to smash deep defensive works. Once more, the Allied soldiers opposed their muscles and flesh to the cruel lash of German steel. Half of us were knocked out either killed or wounded. And going across the meadow, there were a lot more killed 
and uh, we all stopped and laid down, trying to get what shelter we could from the tremendous rifle fire which was coming over. And then a sergeant just in front of me jumped up and said, come on, men, be British. We jumped up and followed him, and he, f he ran about six yards, and he went down. Well, we ran on about another 20 yards toward the German trenches. The German trenches were literally, literally packed. Uh, they were standing about four deep, firing machine guns and rifles at, straight at us. The attack on the Aubert Ridge had been stopped in its tracks. But the worst of the shell and gun shortages was yet to come in the offensive at Festubert a week later. We were in a battery of 15 pounders, four guns, and consistently short of ammunition, uh, being allowed four rounds per day for registering, etc. As the intensity of the battle grew to May the 24th, we ran completely out of ammunition and were left there absolutely helpless. Silent guns, a mutilated army, spring hopes dashed. Yet all this was still hidden from the British people at home. In their censored newspapers, they read comforting accounts of devastating British gunfire. At 5 a.m., the bombardment began. Then the infantry swept forward. The dazed German soldiers in their frontline trenches were helpless under the weight of the intense bombardment and determined attacks of our British men. It was Sir John French himself, the commander-in-chief in France, who put an end to the conspiracy of silence over shells. He told the story of the shortages and their effects to the military correspondent of the Times. On the 14th of May, the truth was out. The infantry did splendidly, but the conditions were too hard. The want of an unlimited supply of high explosive was a fatal bar to our success. The reality of the war was at last coming home to Britain, as it had already to the French and the Russians. The reality of a new kind of war, a war of industrial might, in which Germany was so far overwhelming. This was a war which France and Britain had hardly begun to fight. <laughs> 